Scenes and Adventures in the Semi-Alpine Region of the Ozark Mountains of Missouri and Arkansas, 1853, by Henry Rowe Schoolcraft. Introduction, number two. De Soto, in 1541, was the true discoverer of the Mississippi River, and the first person who crossed it, who has left a narrative of that fact. Although it is evident that Cabaca de Vaca, and the noted survivor of the ill-fated expedition of Narvaez in 1528, must, in his extraordinary pilgrimage between Florida and the eastern coasts of the Gulf of California, have crossed this river, perhaps before him, but he has not distinctly mentioned it in his memoir. Narvaez himself was not the discoverer of the mouth of the Mississippi, as some persons have conjectured, inasmuch as he was blown off the coast and lost east of that point. The most careful tracing of the narrative of his voyage in boats along the Florida shore, as given by de Vaca, does not carry him beyond Mobile Bay, or at farthest Perdido Bay. De Soto's death frustrated his plan of founding a colony of Spain in the Mississippi Valley, and that stream was allowed to roll its vast volume into the Gulf a hundred and thirty-two years longer before it attracted practical notice. Precisely at the end of this time, namely in 1673, Monsieur Joliet, Accompanied by James Marquette, the celebrated enterprising missionary of New France, entered the stream at the confluence of the Wisconsin, in accordance with the policy and the plan of exploration of the able, brave, and efficient Governor General of Canada, Count Frontenac. Marquette and his companion, who was the chief of the expedition, but whose name has become secondary to his own, descended it to the mouth of the Arkansas the identical spot of De Soto's demise. La Salle, some five or six years later, continued the discovery to the Gulf, and Hennepin extended it upward from the point where Marquette had entered it, to the falls of St. Anthony and the River St. Francis. And it is from this era of La Salle, the narrators of whose enlarged plans, civic and ecclesiastical, recognize the Indian geographical terminology, that it has retained its Algonquin name of Mississippi. It is by no means intended to follow these initial facts by recitals of the progress of the subsequent local discoveries in the Mississippi Valley, which were made respectively under French, British, and American rule. Sufficient is it for the present purpose to say that the thread of the discovery of the Mississippi North and west of the points named was not taken up effectively till the acquisition of Louisiana. Mr. Jefferson determined to explore the newly acquired territories and directed the several expeditions of discovery under Lewis and Clark and Lieutenant Z. M. Pike. The former traced out the Missouri to its sources and followed the Columbia to the Pacific while the latter continued the discovery of the Mississippi River above St. Anthony's Falls, where Hennepin and perhaps Carver had respectively left it. The map which Pike published in 1810 contained, however, an error of a capital geographical point in regard to the actual source of the Mississippi. He placed it in Turtle Lake, at the source of Turtle River of Upper Lag Cedra Rouge or Cass Lake, which lies in the portage to Red Lake of the Great Red River of the North, being in the ordinary route of the fur trade to that region. In 1820, Mr. Calhoun, who determined to erect a cordon of military posts to cover the remotest of the western settlements, at the same time that he dispatched Major Long to ascend to the Yellowstone of the Missouri, directed the extreme upper Mississippi to be examined and traced out to its source. This expedition, led by Governor Cass, through the upper lakes, reached the mouth of Turtle River of the large lake beyond the upper cataract of the Mississippi, which has since borne the name of the intrepid leader of the party. 
it was satisfactorily determined that Turtle Lake was not the source, nor even one of the main sources of the Mississippi, but that this river was discharged in the integrity of its volume into the western end of Cass Lake. To determine this point more positively and trace the river to its source, another expedition was organized by the Department of War in 1832 and committed to me. Taking up the line of discovery where it had been left in 1820, the river was ascended up a series of rapids about 40 miles north to a large lake called the Amegagoma, a few miles above which it is constituted by two forks having a southern and western origin, the largest and longest of which was found to originate in Itasca Lake in north latitude 37 degrees 13, a position not far north of Otter Tail Lake in the highlands of Hauteurdes Terrace. So far as the fact of DeSoto's exploration of the country west of the Mississippi, in the present area of Missouri and Arkansas, is concerned, it is apprehended that the author of these incidents of travel has been the first person to identify and explore this hitherto confused part of the celebrated Spanish explorer's route. This has been traced from the narrative, with the aid of the Indian lexicography, in the third volume of his Indian History, page 50, just published, accompanied by a map of the entire route from his first landing on the western head of Tampa Bay. Prior to the recital of these personal incidents, it may serve a useful purpose to recall the state of geographical information at this period. The enlarged and improved map of the British colonies with the geographical and historical analysis accompanying it of Lewis Evans, which was published by B. Franklin in 1754, had a controlling effect on all geographers and statesmen of the day, and was an important element in diffusing the correct geographical knowledge of the colonies at large, and particularly of the Great Valley of the Mississippi. Agreeably, the modern ideas of its physical extent, it was a great work for the time, and for many years remained the standard of reference. In some of its features it was never excelled. Mr. Jefferson quotes it in his notes on Virginia, and draws from it some interest and opinions concerning Indian history, as in the allusion to the locality and place of final refuge of the Eries. It was from the period of the publication of this memoir that the plan of an Ohio colony, in which Dr. Franklin had an active agency, appears to have had its origin. Lewis Evans was not only an eminent geographer himself, but his map and memoir, as will appear on reference to them, embraced the discoveries of his predecessors and contemporary explorers, as Conrad Weiser and others in the West. The adventurous military reconnaissance of Washington to Fort LeBeouf on Lake Erie was subsequent to this publication. Evans' map and analysis, being the best extent, served as the basis of the published materials used for the topographical guidance of General Braddock on his march over the Allegheny Mountains. Washington himself, an eminent geographer, was present in that memorable march and so judicious and well selected were its movements through defiles and other eminences found to be that the best results of engineering skill when the commissioners came to lay out the great cumberland road could not mend them such continued also to be the basis of our general geographical knowledge of the west at the period of the final capture of fort de Cassin by general forbes and the change of his name in compliment to the eminent British statesman, Pitt. The massacre of the British garrison of Michilimackinac in 1763, the investment of the fort of Detroit in the same year by a combined force of Indian tribes, and the development of an extensive conspiracy, as it has been termed, against the western British posts under Pontiac, constituted a new feature in American history. 
and the military expeditions of Colonels Bouquet and Bradstreet toward the west and northwest were the consequence. These movements became the means of a more perfect geographical knowledge respecting the west than had before prevailed. Hutchinson's astronomical observations, which were made under the auspices of Bouquet, fixed accurately many important points in the Mississippi Valley and furnished a framework for the military narrative of the expedition. In fact, the triumphant march of Bouquet into the very strongholds of the Indians west of the Ohio first brought them effectually to terms, and this expedition had the effect to open the region to private enterprise. The defeat of the Indians by Major Gladwin at Detroit had tended to the same end, and the more formal march of Colonel Bradstreet in 1764 still further contributed to show the aborigines the impossibility of their recovering the rule in the West. Both these expeditions at distant points had a very decided tendency to enlarge the boundaries of geographical discovery in the West and to stimulate commercial enterprise. The Indian trade had been carried to Fort Pitt the very year of its capture by the English forces, and it may serve to give an idea of the commercial daring and enterprise of the colonists to add that so early as 1766, only two years after Bouquet's expedition, the leading house of Bainton, Horton, and Morgan of Philadelphia had carried that branch of trade through the immense lines of forest and river wilderness to Fort Chartres, the military capital of the Illinois on the Mississippi. Its fertile lands were even then an object of scarcely less avidity. Mr. Alexander Henry had, even a year or two earlier, carried this trade to Michilimackinac, and the English flag, the symbol of authority with the tribes, soon began to succeed that of France, far and wide. The Indians, finding the French flag had really been struck finally, submitted, and the trade soon fell in every quarter in the English hands. The American Revolution, beginning within ten years of this time, was chiefly confined to the regions east of the Alleghenies. The war for territory west of this line was principally carried on by Virginia, whose royal governors had more than once marched to maintain her chartered rights on the Ohio. Her blood had often freely flowed on this border, and while the great and vital contest still ranged in the Atlantic colonies, she ceased not with a high hand to defend it, attacked as it was by the fiercest and most deadly onset of the Indians. In 1780, General George Rogers Clark, the commander of the Virginia forces, visited the vicinity of the mouth of the Ohio by order of the governor of Virginia for the purpose of selecting a site for a fort, which resulted in the erection of Fort Jefferson some few miles, I think, below the influx of the Ohio, on the eastern bank of the Mississippi. The United States were then in the fifth year of the War of Independence. All its energies were taxed to the utmost extent in this contest, and not the least of its cares arose from the Indian tribes who hovered with deadly hostility on its western borders. It failed to the lot of Clark, who was a man of the greatest energy of character, chivalric courage and sound judgment to capture the posts of Kaskaskia and Vincennes in the Illinois with inadequate forces at his command and through a series of almost superhuman toils. And we are indebted to these conquests for the enlarged western boundary inserted in the definitive Treaty of Peace signed at Paris in 1783. Dr. Franklin, who was the ablest geographer among the commissioners, made a triumphant use of these conquests, and we are thus indebted to George Rogers Clark for the acquisition of the Mississippi Valley. 